Okay, so this video is going to cover general strain theory. So general strain theory is an expansion, uh, or it's built on the foundations of the work of Emil Durkheim and Robert Merton's uh, strain theory. Uh, but it takes those uh, works as foundations and builds on them to uh, extend the theory and, and really modernize it in some, some pretty important ways. Uh, it's mainly built on the work of Robert Agnew. Uh, there's lots of other people who do research and have contributed, but he really is the originator of you know, this form of strain theory. Uh, there are a couple articles in particular, so Agnew 1992 and 2001, that I, I draw on really pretty heavily here. So I uh, take quotes and such pretty liberally from, from those works. So just giving you a heads up that that's where a lot of the sources come from here. A lot of the statements come directly out of uh, those two articles. Uh, one of the nice things about general strain theory, though, is that it moves beyond the structural functionalism that forms the basis of a lot of Robert Merton's work, uh, and to a much lesser extent, Emil Durkheim's work. Uh, so it doesn't have the same kind of limitations that functionalism does. So the argument that all social institutions are vitally important for the survival of the society or the culture that they're in isn't really something that Agnew's work assumes, right? So I think that's a pretty serious limitation of, of general strain, uh, not general strain theory, of um, structural functionalism. And that's uh, not really present in modern general strain theory, which I think is a strength. The basic argument, and this is the basic argument, it's not a, a full argument, which we will get to, right? So this is an oversimplification. The basic argument is that people experience strain and that strain leads to deviance. Uh, the argument that Agnew makes is that people are pressured into delinquency by the negative affective states most notably anger and related emotions that often result from negative relationships. So for Agnew and the modern general strain theorists, the strain is going to be comprised of these negative affective states. The word affective or affect refers to mood or emotions. So they're negative emotional states. Uh, states. Anger being particularly powerful, but others as well. So things like uh, anxiety, guilt, fear, uh, shame, uh, any sort of sense of threat uh, would all fit in this category of strain. And the focus is, a lot of the focus anyway, is on these kinds of negative uh, emotions that come from negative relationships with other people and with uh, social groups and so on. And so strain in this context is comprised of those negative affective states. So strain itself would be the anger or the fear or the guilt or the shame. Uh, again, most notably anger uh, in terms of you know, conversations with deviance, it's really anger that's gonna drive a lot of the um, impulse to, to commit deviant acts, but you know, others as well, okay? Uh, and again, the source uh, for this strain is going to very often be uh, from negative relationships with other people. So we're moving away from a pure focus on the disconnect between, for instance, uh, cultural goals and institutionalized means and focusing on the emotional state that people experience within the context of relationships that are problematic or somehow negative. Agnew emphasizes three sources of strain. Uh, these aren't the only possible sources, but these are the three that he starts his conversation about general strain theory with. Um, they are the actual or anticipated failure to achieve positively valued goals, actual or anticipated removal of positively valued stimuli, uh, or actual or anticipated presentation of negatively valued stimuli. So uh, this is a pretty good example of a theorist, um, uh, I want to kind of like be careful with the criticism here, but uh, you know, this, these are slightly overcomplicated ways of saying something that doesn't have to be so complicated. So, you know, people when they're writing journal articles or they're writing theoretical arguments uh, will feel a pressure to present things in these really formalized ways uh, and want to be very precise and very, um, you know, really want to make sure that they 
uh, are presenting their conceptual frameworks in ways that are acceptable to the academic community, but it, it is over complicated, overly complicated. And so I'm gonna take this uh, and translate it into more regular human kind of words that hopefully will make a bit more sense. Because when we talk about achieving positively valued goals or being presented with the removal of positively valued stimuli, like that's not super intuitive. Um, at least that phrasing, but the ideas themselves are relatively straightforward, okay? So I'm gonna break them down a little bit. So the first, uh, actual or anticipated failure to achieve positively valued goals. So this is getting at the same sort of issues that Merton talked about uh, and later on the differential opportunity structure argument uh, presents. So here we see the failure or the anticipated failure, so the expectation that one will fail to achieve goals. So positively valued just means that they are, that the person uh, sees those goals as positive and they want to achieve them. So if a person uh, either does fail to achieve those goals or suspects that they are, they are unable to achieve those goals, then that can create that sense of uh, anger, frustration, uh, whatever that we would call strain. So uh, some of the some of the examples, you know, again, this is, is very similar to what we talked about with Merton. Uh, someone unable to achieve financial success uh, is, or thinks they're going to be unable to achieve financial success will experience that strain. Uh, someone who values the idea of monogamous dating and marriage uh, to uh, build the foundation for a family uh, and doesn't feel like they're able to uh, achieve that goal or isn't able to achieve that goal, uh, would experience strain as well. Now, there's also smaller things too. I mean, I don't wanna give the sense that people only experience strain when they are in a situation where uh, they can't live a life of financial security or they think they're gonna be alone forever, right? They're, they're much smaller scale things. So even something like not getting into a club that you wanna get into or not getting reservations to a restaurant or not getting, the job you want or not getting, I don't know, concert tickets that you want. I mean, some, that's silly, but uh, but that can be a genuine source of strain too for some people. Uh, so there's definitely different levels of strain. It's not as if uh, experiencing strain has to be this big overwhelming thing where there's some massive life goal that you don't achieve. Uh, really anytime a person has something that they want and they can't get it for whatever reason, uh, they can experience strain. Now, the degree to which they experience strain is gonna vary depending on how much they really wanted that thing and how important it is. So not being able to have a family is gonna cause much more strain than not being able to get concert tickets. Um, but that doesn't mean that the person who's not able to, those concert tickets doesn't feel anger, frustration, feel bad, whatever. Um, so there's definitely levels of strain in terms of the levels of seriousness, but Strain comes from all kinds of sources. Um, so actual or anticipated removal of positively valued stimuli. So here, rather than not being able to achieve a particular goal, here we see someone has something, they, they possess something, um, or they think of themselves as possessing something that they then either lose or think they will lose. So here you have something and you lose it or you think you're gonna lose it. So for instance, a, a relationship ends. So uh, you lose the a relationship with a romantic partner, either through a breakup or a divorce. Uh, if you are a kid and your parents get divorced, uh, that would certainly fit into this category uh, of actual or anticipated removal of positively valued stimuli uh, in the sense that you know, you're used to having two parents around and you might feel like you're in danger of losing a relationship, um, but kids can and often do and probably will experience strain if their parents separate, right? Because it's a loss for them. Uh, the death of a loved one, similar sort of thing, the loss of a relationship uh, for you know, connected to death uh, certainly is, um, you know, would fit into this category. People, people's lives are upended. They, uh, value those around them in most cases and 
when someone is gone, especially if they're gone forever, uh, people don't feel great about that. Uh, and then something like the loss of a job, it doesn't always involve the loss of you know, a romantic relationship or a family relationship. It can be um, you know, losing a job, just anytime you're losing anything that you value. So even you know, you, your car breaks down and it's not fixable. So you don't have a car anymore. Uh, that's the loss of positively valued stimuli. You're, you're losing something that to whatever degree is important to you, it's gone now, uh, and we don't feel great about that, right? So that would certainly fit into this category of strain. Uh, last one, actual or anticipated presentation of negatively valued stimuli. So here, instead of the removal of something that we like, here it's the presentation or the experience of something that we don't like. So if you're the victim of a crime, right? You, you could end up with uh, physical injuries. Uh, there's also emotional trauma that can come along with that. Uh, there's also the loss of you know, items. So if you are robbed, if you lose money, you lose a car, whatever it is. So uh, your sense of security can be damaged, right? So you experience something that's negative uh, and that creates anger, frustration, fear, whatever it is. Uh, if you're a kid arguing with your parents or having friction between you and your parents, and actually it goes both ways too. It's not just a, a kid who gets in trouble with their parents, but also for parents too, uh, having to argue or discipline your kids is not super fun as someone who's done it. Uh, and it's really unpleasant and it can be, I mean, I'm lucky in that I've never had to discipline my kid in, in you know, extremely serious ways. Um, but sometimes parents have to do that or do do that. And that's upsetting for everyone involved. Uh, so the strain goes both ways, right? The kids experience strain uh, and the parents do as well. Same thing with getting into trouble at school or having issues at school. So a kid gets in trouble and gets detention or gets suspended or gets uh, yelled at by a teacher or by a principal or whatever. Uh, that is going to cause strain. Uh, and then, you know, just like an argument with coworkers, uh, anywhere from like a blowout kind of argument to just something fairly small, right? But there is, uh, it's a negative interaction. That there's a negative experience with other people. And that, you know, can lead to anger, frustration, all those things that we would, we would think of as strain. So, just to essentially summarize, uh, strain here uh, is comprised of negative affective states, most notably anger and related emotions that often results from negative relationships. And the major sources of strain, or at least three major sources of strain, uh, are the actual or anticipated failure to achieve positively valued goals, actual or anticipated removal of positively valued stimuli, uh, and actual or anticipated presentation of negatively valued stimuli. Don't try to memorize those three phrases. Uh, you really, what's much more important is that you get the idea of them uh, rather than memorizing the exact phrasing of each one. So people experience strain, right? People experience strain all the time. In all likelihood, you are experiencing strain this very second. Maybe you are in an unhealthy relationship or maybe you aren't in a relationship and you wanna be one in one. Maybe someone in your family is sick, maybe you're sick. Maybe, maybe you're just bored, right? Or tired or frustrated with whatever. Uh, that's all strain. It, it's, it's rare for us to not be experiencing at least some amount of strain at any given moment. Uh, the question is though, is how do we respond, right? That's the big issue. So we experience strain and then what do we do in response to that strain? Well, uh, according to Agnew, people experiencing strain need to take uh, corrective action, all right? Uh, to take corrective action is to respond to the strain in a way that helps them deal with it or removes the source of strain, or in some way uh, allows them to deal with uh, the emotional implications, the emotional consequences of strain. And that's where deviants can come into play. So I get the, the basic model, the basic argument is that strain here leads to deviance. Uh, so let's take a look at a couple quick examples. So for instance, uh, someone loses their job, right? So there's the loss of positive value stimuli. 
And there are lots of implications of losing one's job, right? Uh, the person can't pay bills, they can't buy necessities like food, clothing. Uh, they can't uh, not just cover their own needs, but they can't get things that they want as well. And someone experiencing financial strain can try to alleviate or correct the strain by, for instance, turning to uh, some kind of illegal or deviant activity like dealing drugs, right? If you are, if you need to deal with the financial aspects, the financial losses of, of losing your job, well, one way to do that is to engage in some kind of illicit activity like selling drugs, right? Because then you get money from that. Uh, someone doesn't sell drugs, they don't have that option or you know, for whatever reason, you can end up in a situation where someone ends up, you know, for instance, homeless, uh, which is a form of deviance. Um, that's not the norm. It's not something that we value. It's something that we, we generally look down on and very often punish in one way or another. Uh, and so someone who falls into a situation where they uh, no longer have access to financial resources in extreme circumstances can end up homeless, right? Which is a form of deviance. And so, in both of these instances, the uh, the strain is you know dealt with in one way or another. In one case, the financial the, the revenue the the income is replaced by drug dealing, and in the other situation, the loss of those financial resources uh, just leads the person to lose their home, lose their housing, access to food, um, all that, and so they end up on the street, right? We don't really think of that necessarily as corrective, but it is, right? It, it gets rid of the problem of paying for utilities and paying for water and paying for uh, housing, all those different things. So it's, it's, a, it's a response. Uh, it's not a response people necessarily want to experience, but uh, you know, most deviant responses aren't things that people want to, to engage in. So uh, another example would be something like bullying. Uh, that is going to create all kinds of problems in people's lives. Uh, there's the stress of being screamed at and yelled, maybe the physical harm, uh, the sense of social isolation, the, you know, it just sucks to be bullied and it sucks to have people treat you like that. Uh, and so bullying can lead to a variety of kinds of, of deviance uh, from something as simple as just withdrawing. Uh, you know, one really unfortunate thing that happens to kids who are bullied, um, especially at a young age, is that they can withdraw, right? They can get the sense that nobody likes them, they don't have any friends, uh, or that connections to others are just too painful, so they willingly withdraw uh, or uh, find themselves in a situation where they're isolated uh, and then um, you know, feel like they're stuck alone and then they either think of themselves as outcasts or gradually over time become more and more ostracized for one reason or another. And, you know, that's a consequence, right? So you're dealing with the difficulty of the relationship, the bullying relationship, by removing yourself from situations in which one can be bullied, but as a consequence, um, you end up isolated and alone. Another consequence or potential consequence that's deviant would be turning to a bully yourself, right? So we learn these behaviors uh, and if someone is uh, in, constantly in a situation where they are experiencing fear uh, frustration, anger, that anger especially can be turned towards other people, right? To regain a sense of control or to gain some sense of respect or whatever, right? The, the emotional reaction of the one experiences when they are being bullied can lead to all kinds of different outcomes, social isolation being one, bullying or aggression being another. Quick side note, this isn't really relevant to anything, or it's definitely not relevant to anything. Just want to say, so these, these pictures that I'm getting are for the most part staged. Like this is not, there wasn't some photographer who was wandering around like, hey, I want to find a kid who's being bullied and then I'm just going to watch it happen. Uh, so this is being acted out here. Well, I got to tell you, this kid uh, is just a little too good at pretending to be a bully, I'd say. Like this is a kid who knows how to bully. Uh, he, I don't know. He's, he's a little too into, into his acting gig right there. And then this kid is the most adorable bully I think I've ever seen. Uh, he's just like, yeah, I'm a bully. And this other kid clearly is not uh, all that scared. So like this kid showed up to the photo shoot ready to go, knowing what bullies do. 
And this kid, I don't think did. Um, he clearly has less experience being a bully. Uh, and this kid is like, eh, you're not that intimidating. Um, so adorable, concerning, I think. Yeah, this kid, this kid, I'm concerned about him. So back to the basic argument, right? So again, people experience strain and that can lead to deviance. Uh, but that argument in and of itself is incomplete, okay? So we wanna move beyond those basics and expand our discussion. Uh, and a starting point to expand the discussion is, the, is the, to point out that we're pretty much always experiencing at least some strain. Uh, there are very few moments where you are not experiencing anything uncomfortable or stressful or negative, right? Uh, it's, it's really an all the time thing. Uh, so that doesn't mean we're experiencing extreme strains. So fairly minor sorts of strain uh, are still strain. So being bored, if you're sitting here watching this video and you're like, when is it gonna be over? And you are constantly checking to see how much time is left uh, or the, you know, like the jokes that I try to make, you're just like, oh God, shut up, just, just finish, just, just, be, just be quiet. Uh, and you're annoyed, that's definitely a source of, that's strain right there. They're unpleasant and they lead to uh, un, or negative emotional reactions, what we think of as negative. So boredom, you know, having to feel like you need to eat, being tired, um, feeling rushed, uh, anything, right? All those things would count as strain. Uh, just being annoyed either with, you know, you're at work and someone at work is being annoying or frustrating and you're just kind of like, uh, and you don't get a chance to let it out, uh, then that can be frustrating. It can be uh, something that leads to anger and so on. Uh, and it's just unpleasant, right? It's just a sucky situation. And so strain is certainly something that we can experience. Uh, and then the, just the general demands of life, uh, family, friends, school, work, uh, customers, whatever. I mean, all the things that we're trying to accomplish and all the things that stand in the way of what we're trying to accomplish uh, can create a lot of stress and unpleasantness. And that's all strain, okay? So not every strain is a massive loss, like the death of a family member or the loss of a job or you know, being relentlessly bullied at school. Smaller things uh, also fit in this category. And so we're pretty much always experiencing some strain. But that doesn't mean we're constantly violating social rules. So if the basic argument is that strain leads to deviance, well, then all these day-to-day -day situations uh, in which we experience strain should be leading us to act in ways that are deviant, but they don't, right? And that's true even when we're experiencing more severe strains. So if you lose your job, that's a pretty significant loss, right? And so that can cause really significant emotional reactions that are very, very negative. Uh, being bullied, same thing. It's, it's an upsetting, awful experience. Uh, but even when we're experiencing these more uh, severe strains, even then, uh, we generally are not turning to deviant reactions. And sometimes we do, but we typically aren't. So this argument is either uh, wrong, it's either just, just wrong, uh, or it's incomplete, it's missing something. And so we need to take a, a bit of a more nuanced uh, approach. So uh, the, our, the basic argument is still the same, right? When people experience strain, they need to take corrective action. It's a thing that they need to do. They need to deal with the strain. So again, in other words, they need to find a way to deal with that strain. Uh, and that can often lead to deviance, but there's no guarantee that deviance will be the result. Uh, most of the time, people find ways to cope in socially acceptable ways. So the majority of the time when we experience some amount of strain, we don't turn to deviance. So the theoretical argument, the theoretical model needs to be able to account for that, needs to be able to uh, account for those situations where people experience strain and they don't experience deviance or they don't act in deviant ways. If the theory can't account for that, the theory or the argument is not useful to us because it's not describing what actually happens in the world, okay? So we need to add at least another concept or, or you know, we need to build on the argument 
to make it um, more fully account for the ways that people actually act in the world. And so uh, a more subtle, more nuanced approach is to make the case that, yeah, people turn to deviance when they experience strain, but only if the strain they're experience, experiencing overwhelms their capacity to cope with that strain in socially acceptable ways. So yes, people can take corrective action uh, and that corrective action can lead to deviance. But in the overwhelming majority of instances, that corrective action uh, doesn't, isn't deviant, right? It's, it, it takes the form of coping in one way or another. So whether it's borrowing money from someone when one loses a job or dealing with the stress of an annoying coworker by uh, having a conversation with that coworker, confronting them, uh, or dealing with the stress by going to the gym and exercising or by watching TV or playing video games or whatever, uh, overwhelmingly we have uh, socially acceptable ways to take this kind of corrective action to deal with the strain. And so uh, we can get a fuller model, uh, a fuller, more nuanced sense of what the argument is uh, if we look at uh, this model here. So people experience strain and then people try to cope with that strain using socially acceptable ways of coping with that strain. And if they are able to act in socially acceptable ways or cope in socially acceptable ways, then they conform, okay? So if the person is able to take corrective action and remain within the boundaries of what's considered acceptable in society, they will conform. But if the, if the strain overwhelms their capacity to cope, then in those situations, the person is stuck with uh, deviant coping, right? So they can't cope in socially acceptable ways. So they turn to deviant ways of coping. So it's not the straight line. So the argument is not a straight line. Okay, strain leads to deviance. It's that strain can lead to deviance, but only in situations in which uh, one's coping mechanisms are overwhelmed. So for example, losing a job, right? So that's a situation that is very significant. It can cause an enormous amount of strain in lots of different ways. Uh, and so, well, what kind of strains? strains? Well, uh, when you lose a job, there are financial strains that come along with that. You don't have access to money, so you can't pay bills. You can't buy food or clothes or for medical care or go out and have fun or do any of the things that you want to do or, or need to do. Um, you can't pay bills for your kids, right? So uh, there's just, you know, can't buy school supplies for your kids. I mean, there's an enormous number of consequences uh, if for losing a job and the financial implications are, are massive. But there's others too, right? There's, it's not just, jobs don't just give us money. They give us a sense of identity. We, we, one of the first things that you might ask someone who you just met is, oh, what do you do? Uh, and we define ourselves in those ways. So if we're referring to somebody else, you might say, you know, so-and-so who is an architect or an accountant or whatever, uh, or we think of ourselves in terms of our job. So uh, a, a lot of you watching us right now, so if you're in a class uh, and you plan on being a police officer or a lawyer or a social worker or a carpenter or whatever, uh, you probably don't think of yourself as I am going to be a person who is a carpenter, who is going to be a police officer, you think I am going to be a social worker, uh, as in that's what you are, right? We, we, our, our jobs give us a sense of purpose, a sense of identity, uh, and we define ourselves uh, in terms of our work, right? So when you lose the job, you can lose that sense of identity, which is scary right? and unpleasant. We also lose aspects of our social life. Uh, you know, we previously would have come into contact with a group of people every day, and now we no longer do. And the people that we come into contact with at work often become friends. So we lose the opportunity to build new friendships. We also lose out on things like if after work, everybody's going out to a bar or uh, social plans get made in the context or over the course of the workday, uh, you're not there. So you miss out on those things. It could really affect people's social lives in, in pretty serious ways. It affects people's sense of time and their use of time. Job structures day-to-day -day life, right? You wake up in the morning and you know what you're supposed to do. 
you're supposed to get up and get cleaned up and put particular clothes on and go to a particular place where you're gonna be for eight to 10 to 12 hours. Uh, so jobs structure time. They structure every, they structure your day, right? They give you a routine. Uh, and not only that, they structure your long-term plans as well. So it's not just that you know what, uh, what you need to do today, it's that you know what you're gonna be doing three months from now, right? But a job goes away, all of that structure goes away with it. There are also really serious health implications. So there are the financial right, uh, effects of this. You can't afford uh, high quality food, uh, paying for medications, things like that can be more difficult. But uh, one's healthcare often uh, includes, uh, comes from one's work. So you can lose access to your healthcare, uh, which is obviously can have massive impacts. So there are all kinds of strains that one experiences when they, they lose a job. I don't mean to say this is a complete list, but you know, there's quite a few of them here. But just for simplicity's sake, let's focus on financial strains, okay? And let's think of the ways that someone who's lost a job can try to cope with the financial strains that come with losing one's job. So remember that if someone can cope with the strains, then they will conform, right? If they can cope in socially acceptable ways, they'll conform. But if ones, uh, they, someone doesn't have access to these coping mechanisms uh, or their coping mechanisms are not powerful enough to deal with all of the strain, that's when people will turn to deviant uh, activities to, to you know, respond to, to as corrective action to deal with the strain that's left over. So for instance, a, a person who has access to savings uh, can, is in a position to not have to turn to some kind of deviant activity in order to make ends meet. Uh, does everybody have savings? No, most people don't have savings, uh, but the more savings you have, the better able to cope you are. Now, that doesn't mean that someone who loses their job and has to dip into their savings or who has to use a lot of their savings is gonna be happy about it. Uh, it doesn't mean that they're gonna feel great doing it, but they at least have that option. So uh, they don't have to turn to more illicit means of, of uh, making ends meet. Uh, also, things like credit cards or loans. Now, credit cards and loans are, are both pretty dangerous things. We don't wanna find ourselves getting into huge amounts of debt, uh, but they do provide us with short-term uh, access to funds that we can use to get through those times when we wouldn't otherwise be able to make ends meet, right? So again, it's an alternative, socially accepted way to uh, pay one's bills, for instance. Uh, they're not permanent solutions. So eventually you will run out of credit uh, and eventually you will have to pay your debt. But they are coping mechanisms that people can use at least in the short term. Uh, family uh, can provide coping mechanisms in the sense that they can provide financial support in the sense that they might be able to provide money. Uh, they might be able to provide a, a place to stay. So if you lose your housing, you might be able to stay with a family member. They might be able to assist with childcare. So you need to go out and look for jobs. Uh, and you can no longer pay for childcare, well, family might fill that role. Uh, and things like, you know, borrowing a car. Let's say you, you can't pay your bills, you lose your car. Well, family might be able to give you rides or let you borrow a car or, or something uh, to help you out. Now, are, are they necessarily gonna be able to do that? No, I mean, maybe you don't have family around that could do that, or maybe uh, family aren't in a position to do any of those things. But if they are, then that provides a way of handling the financial loss. There's also other things too, like the, just the social and emotional support that can come along with, with being connected to families. Friends, all the same stuff, right? Same sorts of things. Uh, then there's uh, uh, different kinds of social programs. Uh, so some of them which are private, so things like food banks. So instead of having to go out there and have enough money to cover all your basic food needs, you can get some of those food needs met through food banks. So that can take some of the pressure off. There's also various kinds of government support. So things like unemployment benefits, uh, if you have access to those that can uh, provide you with funds that hopefully can keep you going until you get another job or until you find yourself in a situation where uh, the strain is you know, less pressing. Uh, things like uh, socialized healthcare, so mass health uh, or food assistance with something like WIC uh, can you know, take the pressure off people, uh, at least some of it. 
Uh, then there are things like, you know, job training or education, ultimately with the goal of getting a new job. You know, getting a job itself is a way of coping. Right? That's, that's a way to handle the stress. Uh, it makes the stress the strain go away. Uh, and getting access to training or education can certainly help with that process. Uh, and so if one is able to um, conform, then ultimately that person can, for instance, get a new job. That, that's how one might conform. Uh, ultimately to, to be a conformist. Uh, or if someone can retire or, or live without uh, working, then that is a way to conform as well, right? So neither situation involves uh, acting deviantly. Uh, and there's other ways also to conform, but those are the two major ones. Uh, but if you have used, you know, you've gotten as much money from family and as much support from family as possible, maybe you've gotten none, maybe you've got a lot, but it's not enough. Uh, maybe there's not enough education training, maybe there's just not jobs available, maybe, you know, whatever, uh, your coping mechanisms cannot deal with the amount of strain you're experiencing. That is when people will turn to more deviant uh, responses, like selling drugs, like ending up homeless, like turning to something like gambling as a way to try to make ends meet, which generally doesn't work super well, uh, or they end up homeless, or they end up I don't know, engage in some kind of other illicit activity or they end up in jail or they lose the kids or something else very negative happens to them. Uh, so we see deviance in situations where the strain overwhelms one's coping mechanisms. So as long as one has enough coping mechanisms to handle a situation, will conform. When those run out and we can't handle the strain, uh, that's when we see deviance. So the reason why you, as people who are experiencing strain pretty much all the time, right? Because we all do. Uh, the reason why you're not constantly deviant is because you have ways of dealing with that strain. So you're bored. Well, you can just handle that, right? I mean, it's not pleasant, but you have the emotional and mental capacity to just kind of sit with it and deal with it. Uh, you are frustrated by a coworker. You have the self-control to not uh, lash out at them. Uh, you might have a therapist. You might have friends where you can talk to you about it. Maybe you have a supportive uh, human resources department uh, that you can allows you to, to deal with the problem. Uh, and so you don't end up turning to any kind of deviant response, like screaming at the person or attacking or whatever. Uh, but once those coping mechanisms are overwhelmed, so more serious instances, uh, that's when we would see deviance emerge, okay? So rather than the straightforward strain to deviance, it's strain coping, and then either conformity or deviance. Uh, so this really builds uh, on the earlier strain theory arguments, but uh, really fleshes it out, really makes it much more realistic, uh, accounts for more things, broadens it, and provides us with a more subtle, nuanced understanding of how the world and how deviants can actually work in day-to-day -day life. Um, so yeah, so it's, it's uh, a perspective that's worth, you know, worth learning about, and I think it does a, it, it can do a decent job at explaining. Uh, how strain, or not strain, how deviance occurs. Uh, so that wraps up this particular conversation uh, and we will be starting a new topic uh, in our next video. So thanks and have an excellent day.